Mr. Dudley. Um, are you familiar with this expression here? Cherchez la femme. It's a well known literary cliche, isn't it? There's always a woman involved somewhere. Now, it means look for the woman. And we don't know if Jesus went looking for this woman. But John says that he had to go through Samaria, which isn't technically true because there was a way around Samaria. You didn't have to. So it's quite possible that this had to was because there was a divine appointment they had to keep. He had to go and cherch la femme, find this woman here. Which, of course, makes you wonder, who is she then? Well, for one thing, she is a Samaritan. And the Samaritans went back to the time in the 7th century BC when Assyria invaded the northern kingdom. Israel had divided into north and south. And the Assyrians came and invaded. And they took a lot of the Jews living there away into exile. And they brought a lot of non-Jews, Gentiles, into the area. So a new ethno-religious community was was founded, and, well, they were kind of a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, but at this point in time, they considered themselves Jewish. They considered themselves descendants of Jacob, just like the Jews. They revered Moses, they read the law of Moses, but not the rest of the Old Testament. So they didn't have the prophets, they didn't accept the history books and, and the Psalms or anything like that. But they did consider themselves descendants of Jacob, followers of Moses. And they worshipped on a mountain in Samaria called Mount Gerizim, rather than on Mount Zion, which is where the temple was built in Jerusalem. And they were despised by the Jews, because they were not pure blood, according to the Jewish community. And of course they, in their turn, weren't particularly friendly with the Jews. So. Um, that is what it meant to be a Samaritan. It's important for understanding what's going on. That's why I'm giving you this information. It's not just a history lesson. And there are, by the way, still Samaritans today who still live in that area that once was called Samaria and um, worship on Mount Gerizim. So the community still exists. So she was a Samaritan, which is bad enough. But she also seems to be well, has at least been accused of being an immoral woman. Now, I'm not sure that that is quite fair. Because she has had five husbands. That means she was either divorced or widowed five times. In either case, I think we can fairly safely say that was not her fault. And that she poisoned her husbands, which is highly unlikely. But a woman back then, did not have the power to divorce. So if she had been divorced five times, that was the husbands who had divorced her, not the other way around. And of course, we don't know exactly why, but it's very likely that she was barren, which is why they'd gone from husband to husband. They were hoping for children, and when they didn't get any, they kicked her out. Being barren back then, not being able to have children, was a social disgrace, and it was always blamed on the woman. We can deplore that because we know now that obviously sometimes it's a man who's at fault, but uh, in back then, men could do, do no wrong, obviously. So it was always a woman's fault. And being barren, not having children, was a social disgrace. So she would have been, by the time she'd gone through five husbands and still had no children, well, for one thing, it was probably biologically her fault, if you like. But she would have been an outcast anyway. And if she was now cohabiting with a sixth man, it is more than likely that he was taking advantage of her social disgrace and abusing her, basically. Women had few choices back then, and if this man offered her sort of the security of a home but refused to marry her, well, maybe she took that as the best she could possibly hope for. She was very obviously a social outcast anyway, because otherwise she would not be going on her own to the well in the heat of the middle of the day where Jesus then finds her. And we don't always realise when we read this story just how shocking 
Jesus' behavior is. We read this story at other sites, he kind of had a chat with this woman, he didn't have to sit there on his own. But as she herself points out in, in this dialogue, he's violating no less than three taboos in this short exchange that we have here. Because Jews should not speak amicably to Samaritans. Jews despise Samaritans. He should have run a mile on Jew here. A, a Jew definitely shouldn't share a drinking utensil with a Samaritan. And a Jewish man should definitely not speak to a woman, Samaritan or otherwise. And he's just crushing these walls and breaking the barriers and whatnot. And it's quite possible that because of his speaking to her that she assumed that he was flirting with her, or worse. Because why would a Jewish man be friendly to a Samaritan woman who has appeared there on her own unless he wanted something and we all know what men want. So it's quite possible that she was a bit suspicious and that's why she kind of brought up the fact that he shouldn't really be speaking to her. But then of course Jesus turns the tables on her because yes he asked for water but really he is there to offer her something. And actually he's offering her two things. He's offering her living water and he's also offering an answer to this centuries old rivalry between the Jews and the Samaritans. And let's start with the living water, which is a very powerful biblical image for the presence and the power of God, and more specifically, the Holy Spirit, who is the presence and the power of God coming to live in us. In Jeremiah, uh, God uses this expression a few times. In Jeremiah uh, 17, Jeremiah describes God as a spring of living water. And in uh, Jeremiah 2, God himself complains, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And yes, the Samaritans have definitely dug their own system by creating a sort of pseudo- Jewish religion. It was similar, but it wasn't quite the right thing. But then on the other hand, so had the Jews. When Jeremiah complained, it wasn't about the Samaritans that he was complaining, he was complaining about the people of God in Jerusalem, who set up their own structures, created their own religious rituals, if you like, rather than letting the power of God flow through them. And the thing is, that is a constant temptation for us as well, to try and be in control of God's activities. God is welcome to do something on Sunday morning between 10.30 and 11.30, but then we need to go home and have lunch. So we can't have the Holy Spirit fall at 11.30. <laughs> no, but it's true, isn't it? We do. Not, not conscious, I mean, I don't think anybody has ever spelled it out like that before. But in many cases, that is how it is. We go to church and we expect if God is going to do something, he will do it within the appointed hour so it doesn't upset the rest of the day. And we want to sort of dictate what God is allowed to do when. We are quite good at digging our own systems as well, rather than allowing the living water of the Holy Spirit to flow th freely through us and through the church. But it's quite important to do this. Jesus talks about this a couple of times here with the Samaritan woman, but also in John 7, when he was preaching in Jerusalem and he shouts out, whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. That's the promise, the promise for everyone who will believe. And in case it's not clear, John goes on to clarify, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So this is his magnificent offer of the power and the presence of God, the Holy Spirit flowing through us, welling up inside us. So when Jesus offers this to this outcast Samaritan woman, again, <coughs> he is being outrageous. <laughs> this is scandalous. He's offering her, this woman, something that most people at the time weren't even aware was possible. Direct contact 
with God through the Holy Spirit, God's immediate involvement in her life, this spring of life-giving water welling up inside her. It's an outrageous offer, but the offer is there for each and every one of us. It wasn't just her, it wasn't just like them. This should be a reality in the life of every follower of Jesus. Every Christian should have this experience of the Holy Spirit present in their lives, connecting us with the Father, giving us assurance of eternal life. That's what all this does. It changes our lives. That's why we need that. That's why she needed it. The second thing Jesus offered her was a solution to this age-old theological conundrum. Now, don't fall asleep, because this again is quite important. Because it turns out that Jesus is greater than their father Jacob. She asked that as a rhetorical question. Are you greater than Jacob? And the, the answer actually is yes, I am. <laughs> and he's greater than Moses as well, as it happens. Jacob is the father of just one nation, two if you count the Samaritans, and the covenant of Moses only applies to the physical descendants of Jacob. And then you have the Jews and the Samaritans arguing about who are the legitimate heirs of Jacob and Moses. Who are the true people of God? It has to be one of us, obviously. And then Jesus kind of comes along and he cuts this Gordian knot by saying, well, the Jews were correct until now, but it doesn't actually matter anymore. Again, quite outrageous. You don't say that, either to a Jew or to a Samaritan. It would have been a bit of a shock to the system, I think, but it means that what we're preaching is incredibly good news. Because it isn't just for Samaritans and Jews. Jesus is the saviour of the world. You may have noticed that even the Samaritans at the very end of the passage make this conclusion, which is quite kind of quite surprising in a way. But they might have realised that, well, okay, if the Jews are right, but now this message has come to us, then it must be for the whole world. I don't know. But God is calling true worshippers everywhere. The place doesn't matter anymore. You worship on whatever mountain you like, on, on the plain or whatever, by the seafront. It's a great place to worship God, by the way. No temple is necessary. And your ethnicity is irrelevant. Because anyone can approach God through the Holy Spirit. It's living water welling up in us, remember? Anyone can approach God and worship Him in spirit and in truth. Anyone, wherever. God is spirit, which means he's not limited to any one place. And from now on, the people of God is also not limited to any one place or any one people group. This truth, by the way, it isn't just about believing the true facts about God or about Jesus. That's important, yes, but we can and we do worship even if we're wrong about many things. The fact is, if Jesus will suddenly appear here and do a sort of <coughs> survey, an exam, checking in kind of who knows what, we would all be wrong in something. Every single one of us has got something wrong. And I'm not going to start saying, well, so-and-so is obviously wrong on this and that, but we are all wrong. I mean, I have strongly held convictions, but I'm also aware I could be wrong on some of them. And there are people in this church who would know the law and say, well, you're obviously wrong on certain things. <laughs> so we can worship even if you don't have the whole truth. But we can't worship if we're denying the truth about ourselves. The truth here refers more to honesty and integrity than anything else. This Samaritan woman, she had to face up to her shortcomings. Jesus told her, and she had to admit it. But that's true for all of us. You can't worship if you're hiding the truth about yourself. Because Jesus will only meet with the real you. Just as he did with the Samaritan woman. But the thing is, when he does meet with the real you, that will make a real difference. Because it's only the real you that can be changed and transformed, like this woman. She was transformed by this encounter. And she realised that Jesus is the promised Messiah, so she rushes off to tell her village. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? She's not 
She is not worried anymore about her social standing. Haven't seen this man who's told me everything I've ever done. She's not even trying to hide it anymore. And I mean, they knew what was going on, obviously. But she doesn't seem to have any grudges about them having ostracized her for so long. She's no longer desperate to fit in. She's not desperate to tell others about this strange man and his offer of living water. And she finds uh, uh, an eager audience. I mean, they must have realized, hang on, if this is the same woman that we knew before, something's happened here. We don't really know what's going on, but something's happened, and if it has something to do with this man she's talking about, yeah, we'd better go and see what's, what this is all about. They saw the change. There's nothing that speaks louder about what God can do than seeing the change that he's made in people. I mean, Robin shared a little bit about that as well. Kind of knowledge, this knowledge that, yes, I have a dad, what a difference that made in his life. What a difference it made in the life of this Samaritan woman when she realized that I found a Messiah, or rather the Messiah found me. The Samaritans were also expecting a Messiah, except they called him the Restorer. They didn't call him the Messiah, they called him the Restorer. And this woman refers to this hope in verse 25, and Jesus confirms that, yes, I am he. One of very few instances in the Gospels where Jesus actually openly reveals who he is when he <coughs> admits to being the Messiah. I think it's quite typical, isn't it? Very much like Jesus. He tells this Samaritan woman who's right at the very bottom of the social ladder, he tells her that, yeah, I'm the Messiah, while having several times refused to tell the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem whether he was the Messiah or not. Fairly obviously why. They were asking for the wrong reasons and would probably have had them executed if he had been as frank as he was here. But this woman, she needed to know. She needed to know that he was indeed the restorer, the one who had come to restore humanity's relationship with God, restore worship to its proper function, its proper meaning, and of course to offer forgiveness and restoration to people like her and to people like us. Sinners who need forgiveness and acceptance. These things that only Jesus can offer. So Jesus was a restorer. In a way, that's almost a better title for the Messiah than just calling him the Messiah, which doesn't really mean anything to us. Jesus is the restorer. So then he stays two days with these Samaritans, yet again violating this cultural slash religious taboo that would really have had him walk a long way around. And I do wonder what the disciples thought about it. They probably were a bit uneasy. And they were too impressed, as you noticed, when they came back from buying food and found him talking to this woman. Even though they were a bit too embarrassed to ask what was going on here. But it's kind of interesting because we may not realise this, but the disciples may well have had certain Old Testament passages in mind, because man meets woman at the well, it's a very familiar Old Testament theme, and it generally ends in marriage. And if you look at the two important people that the Jews and Samaritans were arguing about, Jacob and Moses, both of them met their wives at the well. So John may well be playing on this theme here. It may even be that Jesus sort of deliberately arranged so that he would meet her at the well, I don't know. But of course, it doesn't play out as it did with Jacob and Moses, because again, Jesus is greater. Jacob and Moses, they only met their earthly spouses at these wells. Jesus meets sinful humanity and invites us all to his wedding supper. Remember, we talked about that last week. He invites us, each and every one of us, to become part of the eternal people of God. You remember the wedding in Cana? That it reminds us, it typifies, it represents our post-resurrection celebrations with Jesus in eternity. And I think this incident points us in exactly the same direction. This Samaritan woman, 
in a way represents all of us, every single human being. We're not as we should be, we're not where we should be. In various ways, we're all broken. In various ways, we all fail. We're all sinners. And at this point, some people start comparing with others, saying, oh, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm not as bad as so-and-so. I'm doing pretty okay. There's no point, because we all fail in different ways, and we are all sinners. All have sinned. And we all need this forgiveness, this restoration, this living water that Jesus offers. And when we accept it, when we receive this forgiveness and restoration, we become part of the Bride of Christ. The Samaritan woman. She didn't become the wife of Jesus, but she did become part of the Bride of Christ, the people of God. And this is an offer for each and every one of us. You could almost say, if this Samaritan woman could become part of the people of God, anyone can. It's for everyone, this offer of eternal life, this offer of rivers of living water, the presence of God flowing inside us. It's for everyone. We must never forget, Jesus does love and Jesus does welcome everyone, the broken and the outcast, as well as the, one that have, the ones that have it all made, the sinners and the saints, the abused and the abusers, because he is the saviour of the world. And that is amazingly good news. Let's pray.